Bulletin warning, this report contains discussions of racial discrimination, sexual assault, torture, lynching, and other forms of extreme violence. The report contains unedited historical quotations and photographs of white supremacist hatred, torture, lynching, autopsy, and other forms of graphic violence. And physical harm and neglect, Chapter 12, Fourth Reconstruction Era. The Civil War resulted in large-scale death, destruction, and casualties for formerly enslaved people. 30,000 formerly enslaved people died from infectious diseases. 139 sick black soldiers died five times more of 10 than their white counterparts. 140 after the war, African Americans lived in large, segregated refugee camps called contraband camps because there was nowhere else for them to go. 141 hospitals, dispensaries, and military camps were unable to serve the masses of enslaved people, black soldiers, and other refugees who entered the North due to the Civil War. 142 escaped and abandoned formerly enslaved people settled near or within the Union Army's military camps and battle lines. 143 the camps did not have adequate sanitation, nutrition, or medical care. 144 one out of every four African Americans who lived in the camps died. 145 following the Civil War, due to segregation, African Americans were forced to live in overcrowded, unventilated tenements and unsanitary shacks. 146 excessive mortality rates in black communities were caused by poor living conditions, lack of access to nutritious food, and lack of access to health care. 147 epidemics such as cholera and smallpox broke out often where African Americans lived. 148 from 1865 to 1868, Congress created the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and abandoned lands, commonly known as the Freedmen's Bureau, to provide for the welfare of formerly enslaved African Americans, including through issues of provisions, clothing, and fuel, as necessary for the immediate and temporary shelter and supply of destitute and suffering refugees and freedmen and their wives and children, according to the statute. 149 the Freedmen's Bureau included a short-lived attempt to provide medical aid to formerly enslaved people in need, 150 the Bureau was hampered by cities and counties that focused on the health of white people and refused to provide health care for formerly enslaved people. 151 the Freedmen's Bureau was poorly equipped to provide mental health services to formerly enslaved people. 152 the Freedmen's Bureau dispensaries did provide thou sons with annual treatment and prescriptions. 153 however Many of the white physicians affiliated with the Bureau were racist to their black patients and sometimes refused to treat them. 154 after two years of operation, with Southern legislators claiming the costs were too high, Congress ended the Freedmen's Bureau Medical Services just as demand for services was increasing. 155 when the Bureau's medical services ended, formerly enslaved people continued to suffer from illness, destitution, and racial discrimination from physicians and were left with little to no access to medical care. 156 the Freedmen's Bureau failed to provide for the health and welfare of newly freed African Americans, despite the promises made by the federal government. 157 5 Racial Segregation Era Following the Freedmen's Bureau's failed attempts to provide health care to African Americans, the Jim Crow era of racial segregation and discrimination greatly degraded the health of black communities. White hospitals discriminated against black doctors and nurses and treated black patients only in colored wings. 158 black hospitals suffered from underfunding and resource constraints, such as struggles with licensing accreditation and developing links with municipal hospitals. 159 in 1946, Congress passed the Hilburton Act, which provided federal funding to segregated healthcare facilities, further entrenching discrimination and segregation in the healthcare system. 160, the racial segregation of the Jim Crow era was a vestige of enslavement during which African Americans suffered dire health consequences. 161, black patients and medical professionals. During the Jim Crow era, black hospitals and segregated units within predominantly white hospitals were the only viable sources for medical services for African Americans due to pervasive racial discrimination, poverty, and lack of geographic accessibility. 162 some white hospitals operated small wards for black patients, but they were in the worst areas of hospitals and basements or crowded colored wings. 163 these white hospitals did not hire black doctors, and white doctors often treated black patients with disdain. 
164 during World War and after, millions of African Americans living in southern states migrated to the urban northeast and midwest in the Great Migration. 165 during this time, underfunded and under-resourced black hospitals were not able to provide care for local African Americans and newly arriving migrants. 166 in northern cities, black patients who sought treatment in large city hospitals were forced to compete for health care resources with poor European immigrants. 67 private doctors were unaffordable for most African Americans. 168 from the 1880s to 1964, southern states segregated black people from white Americans in every aspect of life, including health care. 169 the Hilburton Act allocated separate funds for black and white hospitals, resulting in a disparity in hospital beds available for black patients. 170 black women often could not afford to have physicians deliver babies in hospitals and were instead treated by black midwives in the rural regions of the South. 171 white patients refused to be treated next to black patients and by black doctors or nurses. 172 most poor African Americans could not afford hospital care. 173 some black doctors could have their black patients admitted to white hospitals however, the black doctors themselves were barred from working as physicians at those white hospitals. 174 white doctors refused to treat black patients like the son of scholar W. Du Bois Bergot, who suffered from diphtheria. 175 Du Bois tried in vain to find a black physician, but his son died when he was about one and a half years old. 176 Baby Bogot's death mirrored the many deaths of enslaved children from the same disease. 177 While white public health leaders and professionals ignored the needs of the black community, black physicians and health leaders traveled to churches, schools, and community meetings to give health care education presentations. 178 Because African Americans were denied medical education, they founded their own medical schools. The first black medical school, Howard University Medical Department, was founded in 1867. 179, it was the first of 14 black medical schools founded between 1868 and 1900. 180 and 1910, the Carnegie Foundation commissioned a report to evaluate every medical school in the U.S. and Canada. 181 in the wake of the report, most black medical schools closed. 182 by 1915, five of the eight black medical schools established in the 1880s and 1990s had closed. 183 by 1923, only two training sites were left for black doctors and other medical professionals, Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Meharry Medical College in Tennessee. 184 at the time, there was intense pre-sure in the medical field to modernize and redesign medical facilities with high clinical and operational standards. 185 black hospitals thus face greater problems adhering to these new modernized standards without the funds or institutional support of major industrialists, premier academic institutions, and political leaders, while also caring for growing healthcare needs of African Americans in the Jim Crow era. 186 due partly to racism, black medical schools were not able to link with modernized hospitals to train their students. 187 without a means of training students and a lack of teaching and funding resources, black medical schools were no longer viable institutions for medical education. 188 from 1900 to 1980, only about 2% of medical professionals were black. 189 as of 2018, just 5% of physicians were black. 90 consequently, black medical schools shut down, in part, due to systemic racial discrimination and lack of government support resulting in the underrepresentation of African Americans in the medical field. Professionals experienced constant racial discrimination and exclusion from medical institutions and professional associations during legal segregation. 191 black doctors were not allowed to treat black patients in some white southern hospitals. 192 black interns, residents, and registered nursing personnel were excluded from white hospitals in the South. 193 black pharmacists were limited to employment in coal or drug stores. 194 many black women who entered the nursing profession were discriminated against and not allowed to enter the nation's major government and charitable health agencies. 
195 black hospitals were the only viable sources for health care for African Americans because many white hospitals did not admit black patients or provided discriminatory care. 196 as late as 1945, Chicago only had one hospital operated by black health care providers that served roughly 270,000 black residents. 197 Philadelphia had two black hospitals. 198 Southern black women relied on private physicians and hospitals for maternity care. 199 even in 1949, when an increasing number of white women were assisted by physicians during birth, most black women had no physician present for birth. 200 until 1954, when the Veterans Administration announced the end of segregation in agency hospitals, black veterans received worse treatment than white veterans due to separate and unequal facilities. 201 white hospitals received public and private funds to establish models of care based on the newest scientific developments, while black hospitals had to rely on their own small community of patients for funding. 202 black hospitals were forced to open in older, outdated hospital structures that were abandoned by prior white founders. 203 The American Medical Association AMA is the most powerful umbrella organization for physician advocacy and lobbying in the United States. For the AMA actively discriminated against black medical professionals and supported state-sanctioned discrimination. 205 from about 1,846 to 1,888, the AMA did not allow black doctors to join. 206, this policy of tolerating racial exclusion was pivotal in creating a two-tier system of medicine in the United States. 207, in response to the AMA racial discrimination, in 1,895, black physicians formed their own professional association, the National Medical Association. 208 from the 1870s through the late 1960s, the AMA excluded and discriminated against black physicians, hindering their professional advancement and creating discriminatory barriers to adequate health care for black patients. 209 during this period, the AMA was made up of local physician societies. 210 societies that were in segregationist states freely denied black physicians entry, yet remained part of the national AMA. 211 consequently, black physicians were denied membership in state, county, and municipal medical societies throughout the South and in many border states. 12. Exclusion from these medical societies restricted access to training and limited professional contacts. 213. Since membership in a state medical society was required by most southern hospitals, this policy resulted in the denial of admitting privileges, which meant that black physicians could not admit black patients to southern hospitals. 214. This, in turn, created barriers to health care for African Americans and barriers to professional advancement for black physicians. 215. Furthermore, the AMA was silent in debates over the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and did not support efforts to amend the separate but equal provision of the Hilburton Act. 216. The Hilburton Act 1946. In 1946, Congress passed the Hilburton Act, which provided federal construction grants and loans to states that needed health care facilities. 217, however, the Hilburton Act allowed separate but equal health care facilities. 218 in congressional debates, Northern Senators William Langer and Harold Burton called for non-discrimination in the use of federal funds. 219 Southern Senators, such as Lister Hill from Alabama, claimed that state legislatures and local hospital authorities had the right to set policy without federal interference. 220 Ultimately, Congress included the separate but equal provision in the Hilburton Act to appease the Southern states. 221 southern states received a significant portion of the federal funds allotted through the Hilburton Act. 222, because Hilburton Act funds were dispersed through regional, state, and local offices, states that were highly segregated continued to engage in racial exclusion. 223 by 1962, 98 hospitals in the South banned black patients outright, while others only allowed black patients in segregated areas. 224, the Hilburton Act allowed patients to be denied admittance into hospitals on account of race. 225, the Hilburton Act thus permitted racial segregation and discriminatory on in health care, a legacy of the racism that existed during slavery and continued through the legal segregation era. Healthcare during legal segregation era. 
due to discrimination and segregation instituted and allowed by federal and state governments during the legal segregation era, African Americans suffered from inadequate care. 226 studies conducted on the black community in the mid-20th century revealed high rates of syphilis, tuberculosis, maternal and infant mortality, and disparities in life expectancy healthcare concerns that continue. 227 communicable childhood diseases such as whooping cough, measles, meningitis, diphtheria, and scarlet fever were twice as frequent among black children than white children, reflecting inadequate access to modern medical treatment. 228 the infant death rate for black children was twice that of white children in the late 1950s. 229 the black maternal mortality rate was four times greater than the white maternal mortality rate. 230 compared to white Americans, African Americans died at earlier ages of hot disease and respiratory cancer. 231 a contributing factor to premature for African Americans was that the federal government prohibited African Americans from accessing anti-poverty programs. 232 as a result, they could not afford or access quality health care. 233 government sanctioned racial segregation and discrimination extended the legacy of slavery, impacting the health care system far into the 20th century and until today. California. In the late 1940s, Fresno lost its only black doctor, Dr. Henry C. Wallace, 234 at the time. Young Earl May, a major in Fresno, was impressed by Dr. Wallace, 235 doctor. Wallace inspired him. It was Earl's mother's doctor and he healed her, Matty Mayers, Earl Mayers former wife, said. At that time, there weren't any black doctors here. Dr. Wallace was Earl's mentor, she said. Earl Mayers then left Fresno to receive his medical degree at Tennessee's Meharry Medical College, one of the only black medical schools left in the United States. 236 many of the black residents of Fresno described the difficulty they had in getting medical care from white doctors and asked Dr. Mayers to return to his hometown. 237 Dr. Mayers did return home to Fresno, where he established a medical clinic. 238, he also established a dispensary and made prescriptions available at wholesale cost, often refusing to charge impoverished patients for his services. 239 hospitals in California that received Hilberton Act funds, 240 discriminated against black patients and physicians. From 1947 to 1971, Hilberton Act funds contributed to 427 projects at 284 facilities in 165 communities in California. 241 of 1950 survey of Los Angeles hospitals found that 11 of the 17 hospitals racially segregated patients. 42 are separate. 1,956 study found that only 24, 8% of black physicians in Los Angeles served at predominantly white hospitals. 243, the legacy of this discrimination carries through today. In 2021, a nonpartisan health organization found that Los Angeles tied Atlanta for the humber of least inclusive hospitals. Consequently, California has a history of healthcare discrimination against black Californians due to the segregation of hospitals in California and the inadequacy of access to healthcare for black Californians, which is a legacy of slavery that carries through to today.